Ladies and gentlemen, the Mount Zion Church of Christ of Savannah, Tennessee presents Declaring the Gospel, brought to you in the interest of New Testament Christianity in the 21st century. Now here's your speaker, Gilbert Goff, the preacher of the Mount Zion Church of Christ. Hello, my name is Gilbert Goff. I'm the preacher of the Mount Zion Church of Christ. First today, I would like to thank you for watching the Declaring the Gospel television broadcast. And secondly, I would like to cordially invite you to come and be with us at the Mount Zion Church of Christ whenever you can. Our meeting place is not hard to find, for we are located six miles south of Savannah, Tennessee, off of Highway 128. If you're coming from the Pickwick Dam area, just as you cross over the Pickwick Dam, we are four and a half miles north on Highway 128. Let me give you the schedule of our services. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 for Bible study. And in that hour, we have classes for all ages. At 10.30, we gather together for morning worship, where we will sing, pray, partake of the Lord's Supper, give of our means, and study God's Word through preaching. We will assemble again on Sunday evening for worship at 5 p.m. We also have Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m., in which we again divide up for Bible classes for all ages. We would love to have you come and be with us, and I can assure you that when you enter the doors of the church building, you will be greeted as a most welcome guest. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce to you the Mount Zion Church of Christ website, which is mtzion church of Christ or chofchrist.org. Now on this website, you can watch the Declaring the Gospel television program whenever you want to by just tapping on the link that will carry you directly to our YouTube channel. There you can watch this program or any that we have uploaded. Read some of the Bible articles on our website. We are continuing to build that website, so check it further and check it often. Now in this program today, I will be answering an important question that one has sent in to us that relates directly again to the salvation of our souls in a Bible question and a Bible answer section. The question that this woman asks is this. The Bible teaches that we are saved by faith, John 3.16. Yet I have heard you say that many times that we are not saved by faith. Now which is it? Now this is a very interesting question. And I intend to answer this question to the best of my ability. So now let's get to this question and answer it. First, I would like to thank the one who asked the question. And let me assure her and you that the Bible indeed does teach that one is saved by faith. At no time have I said in this program or in any pulpit where I have preached that faith does not save. I often quote John 8 and verse 24 where our Lord said, For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. In fact, I often quote Hebrews 11:6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In fact, folks, in every verse of Scripture that teaches faith is necessary for salvation, I believe and I preach. So where the viewer came up with the idea that I believe faith does not save, either misunderstood me or deliberately misrepresented what I teach, I would rather believe the former, that she just misunderstood, rather than the latter, that she deliberately misrepresented me. Now, let me address this question a little further. It is clear in the scriptures that there is a faith that will save. Now, where the viewer may have misunderstood is, nowhere does the Bible teach faith alone saves. Faith saves, but faith alone does not. Thus, there is a faith that saves and a faith that will condemn if it doesn't trust and obey God's word. There's a difference. So that means there are two kinds of faith mentioned in the Bible. There is a saving faith, number one, and there is a faith that will condemn, number two. A faith that involves the mere acceptance of testimony will not save. And I can clearly illustrate to that to you from the word of God. The chief rulers of John 12 and verse 42 the Bible says that they believed on Jesus, 
But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Now, since a person cannot be saved without confessing Christ, as Matthew 10, 32 and 33 teaches, Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10 also teaches, then these chief rulers, even though they believed or had faith in Jesus, could not be saved because they refused to confess him. The faith of the chief rulers was not a saving faith because it produced no further acts of obedience. That is, in this case, confession. They refused to do so. Now, faith based upon mere acceptance of testimony is nothing more than the devil's faith. James, in his inspired book, in chapter 2 and verse 19, explains that the devils believe and tremble, but they are not saved. The devils accept the fact that there is one God, but that's just not enough. The devil's faith produces no further acts of obedience that are acceptable to God. Therefore, a mere professing faith is a devil's faith and will not save. Saving faith, on the other hand, is a comprehensive faith which includes not only the acceptance of testimony, but it also includes trust and obedience. Saving faith takes God at his word. Did you get that? Saving faith takes God at his word. In every case of those listed in the Hebrew Writers Hall of Faith of Hebrews 11, there is faith that produces action. For instance, by faith, Noah, what did he do? He produced action. His trust and obedience to God caused him to be moved with fear, and he prepared an ark to the saving of his house, Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Note that. The saving of his house did not come until by faith Noah obeyed God's command to build the ark. Read Genesis 6, 9 through 22. Noah did not only profess to believe in God, but he trusted and he obeyed God. Faith caused further acts of obedience on his part. Now, let me give you one other illustration. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed the voice of God and went into a country he knew not where. By faith, Abraham, when he was called out to go out into a place which he should re after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. Look at Hebrews 11 and verse 8. Note that the inheritance was not Abraham's possession until by faith he obeyed God. Abraham did not only profess to believe in God, but also he trusted and he obeyed God. Faith caused further acts of obedience. Faith that trusts and obeys will obey all of God's commands. You believe in God's word. When God tells us to repent of our sins, we'll repent. When God tells us to confess the name of his son, we'll confess it. When God tells us to be baptized in order to be saved from, for the remission of our sins, to be added into Christ and into his church, we're going to be baptized. Why? That's faith in action. Faith that has produced further acts of obedience because we trust in the God whom we serve. Remember, folks, faith always takes God at his word. At this time, the Mount Zion Church of Christ would like to extend an offer of a free 25-lesson Bible correspondence course to any and all of our viewers of the Declaring the Gospel television broadcast. Twenty-five Bible subjects are covered that will be a challenge to you and your study of God's Word. This course, if you choose to enroll, costs you nothing. It is free to you upon the condition that you write us or call us, give us your name and address, and when upon reception of your first lessons, you will get your Bible and study the lessons at your convenience. When you have finished studying the lessons and answered the questions, drop them back in the mail to us in a self-addressed envelope, which we provide. When we receive the lessons, we will grade them and return them to you with more lessons. To receive the free Bible correspondence course, write to us at this address, Mount Zion Church of Christ, 5905 Highway 128, Savannah, Tennessee, 38372, or call us at this number, 
3423. We will send it out to you right away. It is time now for our Bible study. Well, I hope that all of our viewers that have not enrolled in our Bible correspondence course will take advantage of that and join in the study of God's Word with us through this means. Again, we pay for all the postage and handling. I also would like to thank the one who called and gave me the question to answer on today's broadcast. Now, I want to encourage all of our viewers that if you ever have any Bible questions or any uh, criticisms of anything about this broadcast, or just want to further question me about something that I've said in this broadcast, don't be afraid to call or write us. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, I'll answer any of your questions uh, that are Bible-related and uh, good questions. I'll be happy to answer them on a future broadcast of Declaring the Gospel. So by all means, folks, write to us, call us. We'd love to hear from you. We have been studying about the church, the one church that you read about in the New Testament. We talked about the word church itself, meaning the called out ones, comes from a compound Greek word, eklesia, which ek is the out of, lesia has to do with the calling. And so you have the called out ones into an assembly. And we have identified that those who are called out in the church, that they are the ones who have been called out of sin and darkness and have been translated into God's kingdom, uh, into his marvelous light. And so we talked about the church and how the, the church is comprised of those who have been called out of sin and darkness into a life of righteousness, walking in the light of Jesus Christ. We also studied about the church in regard to it being a kingdom. Oftentimes the Bible refers to the church as the kingdom. It did in prophecy. It did in the days of Jesus as he was coming about to preaching the gospel of the kingdom to establish that kingdom, which he eventually would on, after his death, burial, and resurrection, ascension back to the Father. And you can read about the establishment of that kingdom in the book of Acts in chapter 2, and you can see how it advanced and how it grew phenomenally in the first century. Now that was nothing more than the church, because Jesus used the term church and kingdom interchangeably, like he did in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. We looked at the kingdom and we saw that the kingdom has to have a king. Well, Jesus is that king. We also looked at the kingdom and saw that the kingdom is comprised of citizens, that's Christians. We also saw that the kingdom has a law, and it'd be ridiculous for a king to have citizens that does not have a law that uh, helps uh, citizens to do right, to live righteously. And Jesus has such a law. And thus uh, we have this beautiful, beautiful metaphor, the kingdom of heaven, that describes the church of Jesus Christ. Now today we want to continue our study of the church. And I want us to look at the church from another metaphor, and that is the one that the, the Apostle Paul champions to the great degree. If you were to turn to the book of Ephesians and look at chapter 1 and verse 22 and verse 23, Paul in talking about the church has said he that God hath put all things under his feet, that is Christ's feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth the all in all. Now I want you to know that Paul described the church as a body. The church is described as a body that belongs to its head, and the head is Jesus Christ. Now I want you to understand it would be a monstrosity for a head to have many bodies. But that's precisely what denominationalism and sectarianism implies. That Jesus Christ the head, or the king, has more kingdoms, and if he's the head, he has more than one body. But that's simply not the case. The Bible clearly teaches, like in Ephesians chapter 4, in verses uh, beginning at verse 4, it says, there is one body. That is one of seven ones that uh, emphasize the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. 
So Jesus, or Paul writes that there is one body, and that body, of course, is uh, the head of it is Jesus Christ. Now we also know that that body is comprised of many members. Uh, as our human bodies, as we have this metaphor in the description of a body, I have many members to my body. I have eyes, I have ears, I have fingers, I have legs, and so on. So you have different parts of the body. Well, members are described as parts of the body of Jesus Christ. I can turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and verse 5. Where the Apostle Paul said, for we, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. I know that some want to pervert this passage and say, well, those, those many members that make up the body of Christ are the various churches and denominations. The problem with that is, is that the denominations teach and practice things that Christ never authorized. These ones that Paul was addressing was in the Roman church. And I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic church either because that's a Johnny come lately. The Lord's church, the one established on the day of Pentecost and just a few years later was established in the city of Rome, it was the church of Christ. And these people had, they were under the headship of Jesus Christ. They were comprised into one body, but there were many members in that one body. We could say the same thing here at the Mount Zion Church of Christ. Our head is in heaven. That's Jesus Christ. In the Mount Zion Church, there are many members. And those members comprise the one body. As all my extremities of my body compose and make up my body. I'm one, and yet I'm many members. You know, I don't know if there's a better passage that this, Paul describes this concept of the one body with many members better than you can find in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. Paul was writing to the Corinthian brethren. Now I want to begin reading at verse 12 with you. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body many being many, are one body, so also is Christ. In other words, Christ is a part of that one body. He's the head of it. He said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. You want to get into the body? You have to be baptized. When people deny the efficacy or the importance of baptism, they're telling you that you don't have any means to get into the body. And notice it says that whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. The one spirit is the truth that the spirit reveals that uh, teaches us that we need to be baptized into the one body. Go look at the seven ones of Ephesians chapter 4, 4 through 6. You'll see that Paul would talk about the same ones right there. He says, for the body is not one member, but it's many. He said, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. Of course not, Paul's implying. He says, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Again, a rhetorical question implying the negative. The ear can't say, I'm not part of the body, because I'm not the eye. No, every member of the body comprises the same. He said, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. Again, there's no denominationalism in the context here. This is talking about individual members within the Corinthian church that make up the one body that meets in that location under the headship of Christ. He said, "For and now they are many members, yet one body. How many times does Paul have to emphasize this? I mean, I could read further in this same chapter and Paul would continue the same theme. He's trying to get across to these Corinthian brethren how they need to be unified in one body, as he taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, that they are to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. There are not supposed to be any divisions among them because they are part of one body under one head that determines their direction and their way of life. 
So you have the one body metaphor. Again, every time the body, by, by the way, every time the word of God or uses a metaphor to describe the church, I hate to tell you this. No, I don't. Because it's absolute truth. Every metaphor always is singular. I don't care if you're talking about the kingdom of Christ, if you're talking about the body of Christ, if you're talking about the house of God, if you're talking about the temple of God, it's always singular. It never refers to a multiplicity, all referring and describing some particular aspect of the Lord's church. Now let's proceed on with our concept here that Paul brings out about the one body. As I have said and emphasized that Christ is the head of the body. That means that all the members of the body are subject to its head. Now, my hands, my gestures are determined by how my mind thinks. Here's my head, it controls every member of my body. And that's the same thing, the same picture you have of the New Testament church, the church of Christ, the one that belongs to Him. Notice in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 18, that Paul says, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the one that's in control. He, it is the love of Christ that constrains us or controls us because of the fact that we are in his body. The body reacts, the body does what the mind or the head of the body tells it to do. For instance, Paul was making a comparative study in Ephesians chapter 5 of the relationship of the husband and the wife and Christ and his church. And he says, for as the husband is the head of the wife, so Christ is the head of the church. Notice the church. The husband can't have more than one wife and be right with God. It's supposed to be one man, one woman for life. Well, you know, in that marital arrangement, we find that Christ is married to the church. And therefore, we, the church is the bride of Christ. And Christ, who is the head of that marriage partner, who is the church. It's just an obvious analysis or comparative study that Paul makes to bring out to the emphasized to people how Christ is head over his church. Now, I would ask this question, why is it that one should be a member of the body? Now, that's an important question. First of all, I would emphasize this. When Paul made a comment that he said that Christ is the head of the church and he is, well, listen, the Savior of the body. Thus, if you're not in the one body, you're not a part of the saved. It is so important that you be a part of the body because it's just like it's so important that you be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. And that means by being born again, which is baptism for the remission of sins, to walk in a newness of life, Romans 6 and verse 4. That's how you become a citizen of the kingdom. But guess how we've already seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Why? Because that's where God placed the saved. We emphasized that a couple weeks ago in this broadcast, that the church is comprised of the saved. Jesus is the Savior of the body, and if you're not a part of it, you're not a part of the saved. At the same time, we are reconciled unto God through Christ and His body. Now, reconciliation is one of those lofty expressions in the Scripture. It has to mean, simply, that we've been brought back into a right relationship. Outside of Christ, we're lost. When we have been brought, back in, brought into Christ, into that one body, we are reconciled. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, Paul emphasizes that to the Corinthian brethren. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us, that is Christians, to himself by Jesus Christ. They are the reconciled ones. The members of the church are reconciled. They've been brought back into a right relationship to God. That's why you need to be a member of the one body. Again, in Ephesians 2 and verse 16, 
Paul said, and that he might reconcile uh, both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The both refers to the Jew and the Gentile. All men can come into that one body because of the cross. We can all be reconciled together. All differences are put aside because we have one head that directs us. I know another reason why you ought to be a member of the body. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, when Paul was writing to the body of saints at the, in the city of Ephesus, he said, Who hath blessed us, the church, with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. You better be in the body to be in Christ Jesus, because that's where all spiritual blessings are. There are no spiritual blessings outside of Jesus Christ. Such spiritual blessings as the forgiveness of sins. Such blessings as the opportunity and the privilege to talk to God as our Father through Jesus Christ. These are spiritual blessings that are in Christ, and they're not for everyone. They're for those who are in the body. One other point I'd like to make, that salvation is in Christ. That means if you're not in Christ's body, you're not in Christ. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Folks, the Bible teaches clearly how to get into Jesus Christ. And if one has not entered into Jesus Christ for salvation, which is in his body, the body is comprised of the saved, the one church, then you're lost. But when I turn to passages like Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. When you put on Christ, you become a member of his body, the one that Paul addressed many times. Notice this in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. If you want an eternal life with the Son then you are going to have to become a Christian and become a member of the one body you read about in the New Testament. It's called the Church of Christ. It's called the Kingdom of Heaven. It's called the body of Jesus Christ. Why am I emphasizing this? Because I don't want anybody to be lost. Lost in the world of denominationalism, of men's theories and men's doctrines. I want you to believe what the Bible teaches. Check it out. Have I told the truth? If I have, then obey it. If I haven't, then correct me. Folks, I want to thank you for watching the Declaring the Gospel television broadcast. I would encourage you to tune in again next week at the same time. And may God bless you in the study of His Word.